Thank you for the invitation and for such a large audience. I thought this would be a smaller kind of setup, but I hope you find it interesting what I'll talk about. So I, I work mostly in electricity, so I'll talk about, I would say smaller, smaller challenges than what Pierre was talking about. So thinking more about decarbonization and how we get it done rather than the 3Ds that, you know, make the challenge even bigger. Um, so I'll do that by talking first about the bigger picture and then I'll talk about a few of those challenges with my own research. So I think instead of 11 papers, you will see 14 papers these two days because I'll talk about three papers. It's a bit too early for tapas, but you can think about these as, you know, three tapas uh, about my research. Um, so this I don't think it's needed in this audience, but there is this need to decarbonize. I believe for Europe, it's, it's basically, if we think about the world, it's the part of the world where it makes the most sense because we don't have fossil fuels compared to the US. I agree that the US has no incentive to decarbonize and if you talk to them, they are always behind. In Europe, we don't have that much of reliable gas and recently it's even less reliable. So we take the challenge of decarbonizing the grid and electrifying our economy a bit more seriously than in the US. And we have been making substantial progress, uh, but, um, but there are challenges to it uh, because it does cost quite a bit of money. Um, and it's not just about getting the wind farms and the solar far uh, farms in there. We also need to get new infrastructure in the grid that also costs uh, billions. Um, these, uh, all these investments are vulnerable uh, to climate shocks and climate shocks themselves might make the need for these investments larger. And on top of that, the electricity sector needs to potentially grow and absorb transportation, part of the industrial processes, and residential heating and commercial heating. So it's uh, a sector that is in need for huge investments and has been transforming quite fast, uh, but maybe not fast enough. So I wanted to talk about some of those challenges. So the good news again for Europe is that we don't have their cheap subsidized natural gas like the United States and renewables are relatively attractive. Uh, especially if you add a carbon tax on top of it, uh, solar and wind are today among the cheapest ways of producing power. And they are in some ways more reliable than natural gas uh, because you don't have to ask for it every month. Uh, once you have the solar panels, they are on your soil, you can recycle them and it's a source of continued close to zero um, marginal cost power. So it's Again, uh, the, the, maybe the only good news in, in my presentation, but it is uh, good that for many, many regions, and unfortunately not the US, as has been mentioned, this is an attractive option. And we have seen this uh, throughout. You can see here the share of renewables, sorry that the graph is lacking the variable, but it's the share of renewable production, mostly wind, solar and water that we have in different regions. And you can see that not surprisingly, given what I just told you, Europe has been one of the areas with the most decisive uh, progress in terms of renewable share. And it has been increasing almost at 50%, which again, it's a tremendous transformation if we think about this in the scale of 10 years. Uh, other regions that have not that much progress, uh, we can see, for example, the Middle East. Not surprisingly, it's a very low share, although they are very well located for solar too. So some hope that they will still and are finding profitable to do some solar, but not at the scale that's necessary. And then if we look at North America, some progress, uh, although starting from a very low base, and in the United States, again, it's extremely heterogeneous. There are some places like California that if you cheat a little bit and you don't count imports into California, they basically look like um, they are decarbonized or close to being decarbonized. Uh, and some areas of the US that are purely based on coal and gas still today and have very limited renewable power. Um, so, some progress, but far from the zero goal that we had. And it, it's useful to, 
keep in mind that when we say net zero to 2050, it's well understood that that requires net zero in the electricity sector by way earlier than 2050. So, so we are behind because the goal is not net zero by 2050 in the electricity sector. Uh, but substantial progress and at least something to, in my opinion, something to at least acknowledge that we have done some progress. And for, the, for Europe in particular, this is a way to hedge against future cost shocks that you were talking about to oil and gas. This is the best protection against these future uh, oil shocks or gas shocks um, in the form of even more expensive gas. So there are uh, challenges that make that this transition is slower and maybe harder than, than needed. I'll talk about some of them. So one is the fact that wind and solar are not available in a consistent way. And here in Belgium, you would know quite a bit about the solar part of that. Um, in Spain, we have very good sun, but wind is not that reliable and it's very seasonable. seasonal. So we, we do have that challenge of how to accommodate renewables that we cannot just choose when they produce. And here there's a lot of progress in batteries, but uh, I agree that Europe is not leading on that front. It's a consumer of those technologies, but not as much a developer of those technologies. Uh, transmission and reliability, as I was mentioning, to do the transition, we need a lot of investment in capital goods, very, very intensive capital goods in the form of transmission lines, both at high voltage, these would be transatlantic, uh, not transatlantic, but uh, transnational lines that, um, that are at very high voltage, and then um, distribution investment, so that the electric vehicles, the solar panels, and everything else is working well at the city level. So um, there's also a challenge of a stranded assets and the incentives that those stranded assets generate. Uh, as well as the problem of the cost of financing. So what's happening, for example, in some regions of the world, let's say in many countries in Africa, is that solar would be a very good technology for them because they have really good location in the world with respect to solar. And many of them have consistent radiation throughout the year. It would make them much more resilient because they would not be exposed to natural gas fluctuations and being the last person on the line to get those resources, uh, but they are finding it very difficult to finance those investments. So what we are seeing in some places in Africa is that even though solar is already cheaper in theory, they are stranding assets into coal and natural gas, which is obviously a problem for the future because you will have these coal and gas power plants that are relatively brand new and that people keep using. In the US, this is a huge problem. Natural gas is dirt cheap, and there are all these stranded assets that are being uh, built. I don't think they plan to strand them. They plan to keep using them, but it's a problem for all of us. I will be talking today about the stranded assets in the coal sector, because similar dynamics are happening with, I would call, the first transition, going from coal to gas. Now we are in the mood of the second one. But on that first transition in the US, I'll show you that there's some, some challenges with that. Then as we push and ramp this up, it gets more expensive. Having a little bit of wind, it's very attractive. Having some more wind can be quite attractive, but as we try to ramp it up, it becomes harder. So there's an issue of acceptability. Some of it is just for not in my backyard kind of concerns, but some of it is more equity concerns. Who is paying for this? How is it impacting the bill of those households that can have rooftop solar? How is it impacting the bill of the households that are left behind? Um, another challenge is shop transitions. Uh, all of these things are very technical and require people with a lot of human capital, and we just don't have a lot of uh, people trained in these areas. And more broadly, the fiscal pressure challenge. We need to spend a lot of money, and I would say setting aside security concerns and other fiscal pressures or the elderly aging population in Europe, uh, even, even within climate policies, we will see a growing tension between money to build renewables and money to adapt to floods, money to adapt to extreme heat, money to adapt to many of the consequences of climate change. 
And finally, when it comes to the energy transition, for the first time in years, solar panels are coming up a bit more expensive than previously, and part of it is uh, the cost of manufacturing and inputs, but also part of it is uh, starting increased tariffs and uh, trade wars uh, related to these commodities. Um, you all know about um, electric vehicles and all the, like the trade uh, wars that are starting in electric vehicles. I guess electric vehicles, I forgot to say, this is another example of a stranded assets. The fact that we have so many jobs in the car sector, the fact that we have so many leading companies in this combustion engine uh, industry has made the transition very slow for Europe. Too slow in my opinion because now we are very much behind and probably we cannot catch up. But it's very, very difficult questions that are very hard to answer. So today I will talk about some of these issues. I'll try to highlight some positives too. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's the plan. So I'll talk about the first three challenges. Uh, the first one will be talking about intermittency. What do you do with wind and solar when they are intermittent? Um, they can create problems for the grid. And what I will show you is data from Spain from 2009 to 2019. And I'll show you that at least in this first phase of the transition, this integration of renewables has been way less costly than people thought. And on top of that, uh, the market has innovated for it to be less costly. And this is, I think, one thing that, again, it's a positive of what's happening with the energy transition, is that ex ante looks very, very difficult, and it is. But as you start doing it, the companies, the operations, the protocols in the market, they adjust, and the costs end up being a bit lower than we thought. So that's kind of something positive uh, to keep in mind. The second one I'll talk about is transmission, and I'll talk to you about a successful case in Chile that's actually exploring uh, manufacturing in Chile. Chile used to have extremely expensive energy and now has very cheap energy that on top of that is quite decarbonized. Um, and it, it's, it will keep growing, so it's one of the countries that have made the most progress. Um, Chile, however, is a bit uh, of an easy case because it's a single country. So I do think there are many open questions in transmission and how we deploy it. But at least for Chile, I'll show you investments that are very uh, advantageous, that bring clean, uh, cheap energy into Santiago, and that can be paid um, in terms of benefit cost analysis. They, they, are, they basically pay back very quickly. Um, so, so this is again a, a positive a story, but I'll try to talk as I present this other paper, uh, what are the difficulties that we might see if it's not just one country, which makes it much harder. For example, in Europe, I come from Spain and it's basically one of the few countries in Europe with good, with good sun. Um, so there's a lot of potential, it's also a very highly dense country in three places and the rest is empty. So there is a lot of potential for solar power and to send that solar power to the rest of the continent that can entail some discussion. So if it's a Spain sending solar power to the rest of Europe, who's paying for the transmission line? Why do we put a transmission line and we just keep it for ourselves? I think it will lead to many of these political economy discussions. Uh, why don't we put all the data centers and all AI-driven electricity demand into Spain? Well, it's also very hot, so I don't know. But, but, but there will be lots of conversations and pressures on how to do this. On top of that, Europe is very highly dense compared to the Atacama Desert in Chile. So in Europe, placing this infrastructure is difficult from a voting acceptability point of view. And it tends to make the investments more expensive because you will have to go with a direct current line that goes under the sea, or you will have to go to with a direct current line that goes under the ground, also expensive. Uh, so, so these are challenges that, that, again, by looking at Chile, we can feel a little bit good about ourselves, but I don't want to underestimate the challenges. And then finally, I'll talk about the stranded assets. The US is really a big concern. And in the study that I will present, it's really about the stranded assets of coal when compared to gas, because for a large part of the United States, 
they are still stuck in this first transition. How do we make cleaner energy, but still energy that contributes dramatically to climate change? Um, what I will show you from our um, work is that coal power plants are sticking around way longer than would be necessary, especially given how cheap natural gas is in the US. And I'll talk a little bit about the incentives that coal power plants might face. I think this is highly concerning for the second transition because we will have all these stranded assets in natural gas. And it is of concern to me, to be honest, that in the European Union, we are still thinking about throwing billions into these assets that should be stranded uh, soon enough. Uh, obviously, there are other objectives, and uh, that's a discussion to have, but it, it will basically lock in lots of emissions for quite a few decades. And as I was mentioning, another case of a stranded assets where we see similar incentives is basically the lack of progress in the auto industry, again, in part because all these stranded assets are already in place. And on top of that, in Europe, they also give many, many jobs. This is similar in the US. Many of these coal power plants, they employ very specific areas of the US. So there are job concerns that are very geographically specific, but that makes, uh, makes it a harder problem to solve. Okay, so I'll go into a bit of detail in each of them. As I said, this is kind of tapas. So if you don't like the first tapa, you can wait for the second tapa. Um, but it will display uh, basically how we as researchers use data from these markets to understand some of these questions. Uh, the three papers are very different in type of data and methodologies. Um, so the first is a case study, a study from Spain. Um, Basically, it's looking at the impacts of wind and sol uh, of wind. Uh, sorry, solar in this decade wasn't as prominent. It has only increased now that solar is so cheap. So this will be looking at the wind expansion in Spain, which um, already in 2010 wind was generating 20% of energy. So a big expansion of wind in Spain. By the way, wind is a little bit more interesting than some of the nearby countries uh, because. Uh, Spain and Portugal are isolated from the rest of the continent via the, the Pyrenees. So when Spain and Portugal have a lot of wind or a lot of solar, they have to deal on it with on their own. I told you California is almost decarbonized, but they do import and export about 25% of their energy demand, so they have a bit of a buffer. Similar to Denmark, they look very green, but they are getting energy from many, many countries in many different shapes and forms. When it comes to Spain, it's a very isolated market, so you have to deal with this intermittency, this solar and wind on your own. So what we do is basically look, uh, so there have been already many papers studying the environmental benefits of wind. And you look at emissions and it's very easy to show that wind is vastly reducing emissions. There are some papers that try to be a bit more critical and ask, well, but because wind is up and down and it's very complicated to deal with it, maybe they are not reducing it as much. But basically the findings are that wind displaces one-to-one -one generation from emissions intensive sources. So you find that the benefits are large. The goal of this paper was to focus more on the cost side and basically examine if wind integration is costing a lot of money to, to the consumers via regulation services. So the fact that you need to um, have regulation from gas plants, coal plants, these are payments that are made so that the gas plants are ready just in case. And these payments, it's basically, in some parts of the world, these payments are already the majority of the payments that these power plants get, because we're, we're using them less and less. So the data is from Spain, it's hourly data, very detailed from the market, and we look at the impact of wind. By the way, in the paper, we also quantify the emissions benefits, how they reduce prices for consumers, and many of the other benefits. But here I will just show you what we find for the costs. We regress the costs of integration, which are these costs that are additional to energy costs in the form of payments for congestion in the grid, for uh, problems with backup uh, services, and we see if they are increasing with wind. So this is just a regression, but it shows you that if you put more wind, these costs are increasing. That would be expected, and it's what engineers were expecting as we were putting more and more wind into the market. 
Our finding is not that this is increasing, this is what was expected, it's that it's increasing much less than we had expected. So that's the sense in which this is a positive newspaper. We are finding that the costs of integrating wind are there, they are positive, but they are much smaller than maybe was expected. So I will show you this in uh, picture form. So here in the y, uh, sorry, in the x-axis, you have the amount of wind. And some days in our sample, wind is about 70% of the energy generated. So we have some days with a lot of, of wind. Uh, and hours, some hours with a lot of wind. And in the upper part, you see that thing that's trending upward a little bit. It's just telling you that if we put more wind, the costs, these additional costs are going up. However, the numbers are very small. As you can see, the cost is increased by maybe one euro per megawatt hour or two euros per megawatt hour. Um, thanks to the crisis, most of you know that the electricity costs about 50, 60 megawatt hours in good times and maybe 150 or 200 megawatt hours. So it's tiny amounts um, despite all the other benefits that they bring. So the overall um, takeaway of the paper is that this is uh, a positive development, a positive finding, because the cost is increased, but really not that much. And importantly, one thing that we were interested in, they don't go convex. It's not that it gets very, very hard some days, rather the opposite, they flatten out. So if you are interested in the paper, we speculate why, but the one thing that I wanted to discuss more broadly is one of the takeaways of the paper that I think is most interesting. One thing that we have seen in many markets, like one question is why are these costs so little if people expected them to be large? And the reason is that we don't stay still. So if things are hard, we come up with solutions and we see that in many markets they have been innovating to accommodate all of these renewable uh, sources. As you may know, Germany went from hourly trading to half hourly trading and then continuous trading in Europe. So we have changed how we transact to adapt to this variability. California, which is usually a single market that does not include the rest of the West Coast, actually convinced every other state in the West Coast to join a single market for last minute changes in generation, which is again a huge development from a coordination point of view that was not expected, but it came out of this need of integrating renewables in a more efficient way. So these are again some of the positive um, the positives uh, from, from this transition that we are basically innovating, not just in technology, but also in markets, in how we deal with the technology. Uh, another example is that wind farms used to be considered problematic for something that's called frequency regulation, and now they are allowed to participate in frequency regulation. So they, they, have, they are finding ways of making uh, lemonade with lemons. Um, and here we, we highlight in the paper an example, a particular example from Spain, but I will not uh, go into this in a lot of detail. I just hope you can appreciate the downward shift in costs that happened uh, with the regulation improvements. Um, perfect, so tapa number one. Let's go to tapa number two, transmission. This is another challenge, and it is a challenge in many jurisdictions because there are transmission needs, and these transmission needs are very difficult to execute. One example is in the US, there's been a lot of discussion in how to treat transmission investments in the US, which for pipelines for oil and gas, very easy to throw a pipeline, well, very easy, relatively easy to throw a pipeline across the states. For uh, electricity, impossible to throw transmission lines across the states, making it very different um, and very uneven. So in the US, there's been a push for transmission, but they are still behind. In Europe, as you may know, there are directives that, uh, I, I'm not sure if the technical is a directive or something else, but some, at least some report, I, I think a directive, but maybe not, that is asking for 15% ability to trade between countries. Spain is behind. Uh, Spain and uh, Portugal, because they are very isolated. Obviously, some other countries are already there. So there is a lot of push in transmission. So I think transmission is very hard to cite, so it doesn't hurt to highlight its benefits, and this is what we do with this study. We compute the costs and benefits of transmission in Chile and basically investigate um, what the bottom line was in this investment. 
The case of Chile, again, is interesting because it happened at quite large scale and very fast, in part because, as I mentioned, Chile has no fossil fuels. In 2004, they went through a very similar crisis where Argentina shut off the connection of gas between Argentina and Chile, and they had no gas, uh, basically. So they have gone through several energy crises. And even in normal times, they were getting commodity prices uh, that are very high because they are very isolated from the rest of Latin America because of the Andes. Um, so similar to the Pyrenees, but at a huge scale. Um, so what we do in this paper is basically uh, use this uh, expansion to quantify the benefits to the Chilean market. In a follow-up paper that would be more suited to this, um, to this conference, I am collaborating with the Bank of Chile, the Central Bank of Chile, to look at manufacturing data and see how the manufacturing companies are responding to this. But that's work in progress and we have no results. So unfortunately, I cannot tell you about firms yet, but it's kind of in the making. For now, I'll, I'll tell you about the market without looking at the reaction from the firms. So we look at these two expansions, one that connected the north of Chile with uh, Atacama, and one that connected Atacama it was already connected to Chile, but very, to Santiago, but very poorly, and it basically expanded that connection very, very much. So in the, I hope you can see more or less the colors. You can see the first one has very different colors, the second one a bit less different, and the final one much more similar colors. This is basically showing the power of trade and integration. And in Chile, this was, a, again, a, a transmission line that had huge impacts on the cost of energy to Santiago. It also had impacts uh, in the cost of energy to copper mines in the north. So on the political economy, the north of Chile wanted to be separate from Santiago because they wanted to be separate from the energy market in Santiago traditionally. Uh, but again, finally in the 2000s, it, in 2017, it got connected. So uh, what we do in the paper is basically look at the before and after for these transmission lines. That's what we do first. But the contribution, bigger picture contribution of the paper is to also compute the investment benefits from the line. So if we do a before and after of this, we will find that prices get closer, but we will not get at how many solar panels are being built thanks to this transmission line, because it just doesn't happen at the same speed. Solar panels can be built quite fast compared to a nuclear power plant, definitely, but, uh, but not uh, at a minute scale. So what we do is basically um, create a model so that we can compute also the solar panel, the solar expansion benefits from the transmission line. So first we do just the event study before and after. And almost mechanically, we should find that costs of uh, electricity have gone down. Again, there are gains from trade in this market, and it would be almost, it would fail all the laws of economics if we found that there is no cost decreases. We do find that the costs in the market went down. This is telling you that the average cost went down by two euros uh, per megawatt hour, or three, between three, about three on average. This is about five to 10% decreasing costs for uh, companies uh, and households, thanks to the transmission line. So we could just compare this to the cost of the transmission line and be done. But uh, this is a very sharp event study around the time that the connection happened. And we would be missing uh, the investment in solar panels that were made to prepare for this integration. So here you can see uh, the integration was announced in 2014 and it came together with a big effort to put solar panels where the transmission line would go. And you can see in the red line, these are the solar panels that they were building them throughout the period before the connection happened. So if we do a, a study that's very narrow, we will miss out on all this impact that the transmission line had, enabling all of these investments in solar. So what we do in the paper is build a model so that we can see how many of these solar investments are thanks to the transmission line so that we can do a bit of a fancier cost-benefit analysis. 
And this is what we do by building a, a huge model of Chile. It's very big for our standards, but it's very small compared to the true market. The true market has two million lines of code. Our model maybe has, I don't know, thousands of lines of code. So it's a baby version of what the operator is doing every single day. And we use it to understand what are the benefits of solar and transmission, the combination of the two in Chile. So I will not give you too much detail on the model, but it's basically an hourly model of the grid in Chile. We simplify Chile to have 11 zones rather than thousands of nodes. And basically we fit demand supply and we compute the transmission benefits again with and without transmission. There are many ingredients that go there. If you are interested, you can go into the paper. What's the bottom line that we find? We compare the costs of the interconnection, which were in the, other, in the order of two billion, so a large investment, and then we compare it to the benefits to consumers and the increases in renewable power. And what we find is that if we ignore the benefits from renewable power, the fact that more and more solar can go into Atacama, we still find that it's worth it to uh, build the line, but it would be hard for a government to justify because uh, the return is more than 25 years. Transmission lines last way more than 25 years, but again, the political span might not be 25 years. However, if we look at all the benefits from solar power, what we find is that uh, the return period is very, very short, about six to eight years. So a much easier investment to justify if we're thinking about uh, passing it through legislation. So I already mentioned that the case of Chile is kind of an easy, an easy uh, cake. They already had very expensive energy, so the benefits from solar expansion are very, very large in Chile, and they have continued our sample stops in 2020 for uh, obvious reasons, but if we cut COVID and we look back at 2021, solar expansion continues in Chile, but in other countries it might be more, more problematic, as I was mentioning. In Spain, we already have more sun than we need in many hours of the day. So how do we deal with that? How do we export that sun? And how do we set up a, a process? Uh, perfect. And now my final five minutes, I guess, in case there are questions, will be on the case study from the US. The US is the saddest case study because there's not, again, if you look at particular states, there are many good news in the US and they are leading in many innovations, California being the biggest example, I would say. But even a place like Texas, they have managed to put a lot of renewable power into the, into the grid. Um, but in the big picture, the US has regions that are very, very much behind. So the, the study that we have is basically looking at regulated areas where coal has a big presence and where coal power plants are regulated by the public utilities. And we try to see whether coal is basically lagging its exit. So because natural gas is so cheap, this is similar to the renewable effect, by the way, if we think about our transition, which is more advanced, with solar being so cheap, wind being so cheap, natural gas will become less and less relevant. In Spain, there are some days that natural gas produces very, very little. It's only kept around to keep the grid in sync. Some other days we need more of it, but again, the returns are being dropped quite dramatically. So it's natural that in a um, competitive market, some of these power plants will start to find exit uh, profitable. In the US, coal power plants are in a similar pickle because natural gas is way cheaper. So they are finding exit profitable uh, from a competitive point of view. What we see in the paper is that the regulated states are lagging behind and are keeping some of these investments alive. Not only that, but they are retrofitting them in doing quite expensive investments to keep using them, but they are already more expensive than the alternatives. So it's kind of difficult to justify, even from an economic point of view, let alone from a climate point of view. Uh, so in this paper, basically, we assess the impact of regulatory structure in delaying this stranded asset exit. And we try to think about how this is problematic in the coal to gas transition, but also quite likely in the gas to renewable transition that we might see um, later on. 
So the tools that we use is some descriptive evidence that I'll show you one of them is this one that's showing that regulated states are lagging behind. They have retired about 20% of their coal power plants compared to 40% of the coal power plants in competitive, less regulated states. Um, by the way, we don't get too much into the particular drivers in our model. We just model the incentives of the utility of keeping these coal power plants uh, around. But a student from Madrid last year had a paper looking at jobs, again, thinking about the auto industry, and he was looking at the states that have more jobs in coal, obviously are lagging behind even more. These tend to be regulated uh, utilities. So this model, uh, this paper uses annual data of investments as well as hourly data of power plant operations to look at this issue. And we basically think about the regulator as uh, having two ways in which to uh, keep the utilities in check. They basically will penalize them if they produce electricity in a very expensive way. And they will also try to keep investments only if they are useful. The utility, knowing that, will try to use coal power plants even if they are not the most cheap option because it's trading off these two things. They are trying to keep electricity cheap, but on the other hand, they don't want the regulator to retire their investments. So this would be the conflicting, the conflicting incentives that we model in the paper, and they are based on public policy discussions that we see in the US. Uh, as we mentioned, natural gas is about I think at the margin it might generate for 20 or 30 euros per megawatt hour. Some of these public utilities are getting contracts for coal that are, that are paying $80 per megawatt hour. So the, the consumers are really paying way, way more for this coal power and on top of that is dirtier. So the empirical approach, as I said, is to build a huge model. This question is way harder, so we have to make way more many assumptions than in the other two papers because it's a very difficult question. To, mo to model the tacit relationship between a regulator and the utility. We do our best with a structural model. We basically try to think about an objective that the utility has that gives it this incentive of over overrunning coal power plants, using coal power plants too much given the evidence that we have, and we estimate the model to make some predictions. So what is the evidence that we have? Let me go to the evidence. We basically look at behavior of public utilities that are regulated versus those that are facing market incentives. And what we see is that in regulated states, coal power plants are being used in many hours that are hard to justify. As I said, they have a cost of 80, the market price is 30, and they are still using them. They are running them, and they, they are not only polluting locally, they are contributing to climate change. So it's kind of all a bad outcome. We look at um, the probability that power plants are run out of order. So this is using power plants that we shouldn't be using anymore. They are outdated, they are stranded. And what we see is that when it comes to coal, the red ones are the regulated states. There are some states in which we are using coal power plants a lot, and we are using them quite a lot even if they are not uh, required. Here you can see the same thing. You can see that uh, when uh, those are the regulated utilities in green, so you can see that we use them much more. Uh, if, if it's a regulated utility, we tend to use coal much more, even when it's not justified. Actually, we find it's about 20%. We use them 20% more than in comparable states. So this would be 20% of times that you shouldn't be using them and you are still running them. I will not get into the details. It's quite a complicated model. We estimate the model and basically we combine the investment decisions of the power plants with the hourly operations to basically predict how fast should utilities exit and how fast do we see them exit in the data. These are the fancy parameter estimates that I'll leave on the slides for whoever is interested. What, what do we take away from this big model? So basically what we find is that if we were just keeping the environmental uh, costs in mind, or even just the pure costs in mind without environmental costs, um, a social planner, if we had the best outcome in mind, we would be retiring coal power plants already now and quite quickly. What we find is that with the current regulation, 
they are only retiring up to 45%, as we predict in the next 15 years. So we have this 50% gap that doesn't go away, even though it should from an optimal point of view. We also find that if we put a carbon tax, it's not going to happen in the US, I think, but you know, in a dream world, we put a carbon tax. We see that they use coal less, but they still keep the coal power plants around way longer than it would be necessary. So this is, again, something to keep in mind for the next transition, depending on regulation, depending on pricing, we will have all these natural gas power plants around that are definitely offering a service, but that eventually should come down in generation. Our point is that depending on the regulatory structure and the incentives, these natural gas power plants not only might stick around without running, they, they might stick around and be used inefficiently, which has climate, climate implications. So these are the three tapas that I wanted to tell you about. I hope they give you a view of uh, research that we can do to try to ask, uh, ask the answer, ask and answer, hopefully, these questions. Some of the papers are quite positive in finding that we are adapting to this energy transition, and it is costly, but we're making it less costly by innovating and creating uh, new connections that reduce the cost of the transition. But many, many areas uh, and concerns uh, remain, so I think it's a great area for economic research, and I wanted to encourage all of you to, to work on these topics. Yes. <laughs>